Hey, North Point, uh, glad you found us. Welcome to worship. Uh, whether it's Saturday night or Sunday or whatever you're watching this with us, man, we're glad you're here. Uh, hopefully, you've downloaded that app by now. We've asked you for like 12 weeks. I'm sure you've got that. Now's a great time to open that up. That's got kind of a list of where we're going this morning. And uh, let's sing a couple songs. Yes, I 
Everybody, thank you so much for joining us for North Point Online this weekend. We are so glad that you're here with us. If you could take out your phone for me right now and go to the North Point app. If you've downloaded it, great. Thank you so much. If you haven't downloaded it yet, now would be the perfect time to go ahead and do that. You can find it on the Apple Store or in the Google Play Store. Open it up for me. And in the Let's Connect option, let us know that you're connecting with us this weekend. Fill out that information. That really helps us to keep you informed on what's going on at North Point. If you're new to North Point, if this is your first time coming, we also want to know that you're here so that we can send you something just acknowledging that you chose to be with us this weekend. After you do that, we would love for you to take time in worshiping God through offering. You can give electronically through the app, or you can also text NCC Give to 77977. That is probably the easiest way that you can do it. We are so thankful for the ways that uh, North Pointers have continued to give through the past um, many weeks that we've been in quarantine. Through your giving, we've been able to keep, um, to keep a pulse on what's going on and meet needs when possible. One of those needs was actually this past week, we were able to find out that our missionaries that we support in Asia, Denise and Laminda Ube Awancha, they work with many people, and in the country that they're serving in right now, Christians are being persecuted. They're not able to get the food that they need um, or the hygiene items that they need simply because they're Christians. When we found out about that, we decided as a leadership team that now would be a great time to act and show the love of Christ to those people. So through your giving, your faithful giving, we were able to send money to Denise and Laminda this week that will support 18 families for the next six weeks ensuring that they have the food that they need and the hygiene items that they need. We love that we are able to show God's love that way, and we would not be able to do that without faithful giving. So, North Point, thank you for the ways that you love. It is making a difference here in our community, but it's also making a difference worldwide. Denise and Laminda wanted to let you know how much they <laughs> they appreciate what you've done, so take a look. Hey everybody, this is your missionary Laminda and Denise here working in Sri Lanka. As you all know that we have been also facing the crazy situation with COVID-19 and we have been uh, locked down curfew for about, I don't know, three months closely and uh, so it's been really a tough time for, for us here. So, But uh, you guys have helped us uh, in this time, especially with uh, these three churches that we work really closely. Uh, you know, as I find out more details, um, people are going through such a hard, uh, devastating time. And so you help uh, for these 18 families. We help at least for a month and a half in their needs. Uh, so we just want to appreciate you guys and thank you for helping us. Yeah, like Laminda was saying, this uh, these families that we selected are with uh, three churches that we work closest with, and these are their most desperate families in desperate situations. They were already just barely making ends meet, as it is working uh, daily wages, the labor jobs, uh, housemaids, and things like that. And so uh, this will be providing for them. One example is this uh, girl, Delini. She finally got the courage to leave her drug addict husband, and that stopped all the income that she was getting. So she started trying to do a business on her own. And with this curfew, it's completely stopped that. So now she's got to support her children all by herself. But because of you guys and your generosity, uh, she doesn't have to worry about how to put food on the table for the next month and a half. So we thank you guys for your help. Thank you, guys. This has been a crazy week, uh, a crazy week for us as a nation, a crazy week as we transition back into, uh, in, into some level of normalcy. And I think the best thing that we can do today to start the message is just simply to pray. Let me, let me lead us in, in a time of prayer right now. 
Father God, uh, we come to you so aware of the pain and the hurt and um, the, the struggles that exist in our world, uh, God, particularly in our nation. Um, Father, there have been so many things that have happened with, with uh, protests, with uh, injustice, with all kinds of things, and we just ask for your help. We ask that you would calm people's spirits, that there would be productive conversations that, that result in change, and uh, God, that we might be a nation, that we might be a people that truly follow you and that stand for you. Um, God, we, we pray right now for the families of, of everyone who has been hurt or wounded or died over the last couple of weeks that, um, that have struggled because of, of what's happened. And um, Lord, we just ask that you would intervene and that you would show your power and that people would be drawn to you at this point in time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Alternate reality, a parallel universe. These have been common themes in cinema since the very first episode of The Twilight Zone. I grew up in a generation that was fascinated by, the, by a world created by Gene Roddenberry, the, the, the world of the USS Enterprise with Captain, Captain Kirk and Spock and Uhuru and Sulu and um, Scotty and Bones. It, it just was great. I watched it as it was designed, designed from the beginning of time to be watched on a garage sale 19 inch black and white TV in my bedroom after school. Uh, Monday through Friday in the afternoons. Uh, it was great. It loved, loved Star Trek. Uh, the series only lasted, the original series only lasted three years, from 1966 to 1969. But about 10 years later, the crew was reunited for a movie that, if I can be really frank, was just terrible. It was, it was bad. But then in 1982, a second movie was filmed and released called the Wrath of Khan, and it was outstanding. Ricardo Montalban. Yeah, many of you remember that movie. And then in 2013, J.J. Abrams wrote and produced a, a movie with a new series of actors, uh, still with Star Trek, with the Enterprise, all of those kinds of things, that was actually a remake of The Wrath of Khan, and it was about an alternate reality. That movie was outstanding as well. Um, today's message focuses on that whole concept of an alternate reality, one that we know is there, kind of, but we don't think about all that often. And here's the deal, we have to think about that world. That world is real and we've got to be aware of it. If we're serious about following Jesus, about being his disciples, we have to recognize that reality and we have to lean into it as well. We're coming to the end of our Powered series from the book of Ephesians. And, and uh, I don't know that there are any two more important messages than today's message and the one that we'll have next week. Before we jump into Ephesians 6, though, I want us to take a look at something that happened in, in Jewish history that was recounted in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Kings. If you want to read about the entire event this, this afternoon, check out 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. It's an incredible story. The nation of Aram is at war with the nation of Israel. But Israel has this prophet named Elisha that God speaks to, and he speaks through to speak his truth into God's people. Um, God tells the, Elisha, the prophet Elisha where the Arameans are camped. And, and so Elisha warns the Israelite king to not go there or when he's in the area to be very careful. So the Arameans, thinking that they can take out the Israelites, uh, are thwarted at every turn because of Elisha's words from God. The king of Aram, as you can imagine, gets incredibly frustrated, really angry, and calls his inner circle together and says to him, hey, who's the what's the deal? Uh, who is, who's leaking information? Who's the snitch that's telling the Israelites where we are and what's going to happen? And his inner circle, his advisors say, oh, king, man, it's none of us. It's this prophet Elisha. 
Israel has this prophet Elijah, and God tells him what you tell uh, us, what, what you talk about in your bedroom, Elisha hears from God. So the king of Aram thinks, okay, what do we do? We, we've got to find Elisha and kill him. And his advisors say, that's easy. He's in the town of Dothan. So, so the king of Aram sends his armies to surround the city of Dothan. Elisha's there. Uh, overnight, the, the city is surrounded. It's trapped. And, and they're ready to come in and kill Elisha. Elisha's servant wakes up that morning and goes out and he looks out and he sees that the city is surrounded and he's scared to death. He doesn't know what to do. And Elisha says to him, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. God, open my servant's eyes. 2 Kings 6.17 says this, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There is an alternate reality to this world that we live in, one that we can't see with our physical eyes, but it's going on all around us every moment of the day. That reality is a spiritual reality, a spiritual battle that's taking place all around us. And just like Elisha's servant, we can only see part of it unless God allows our eyes to see more. We live in the midst of a spiritual battlefield. There's a war that's going on around us. We're in the middle of a war zone. So go ahead right now and take out your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to move into what is the conclusion of this letter to the church in Ephesus that, that Paul writes. And these closing words are so critical for us today about the spiritual battle. Paul starts in verse, in verse 10 of Ephesians 6 and says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and, thor and authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. We live in a spiritual war zone, in a spiritual battle, and if we don't realize it, our enemy will destroy us. God says through Paul, this is a battle for which you need armor. It's a battle that you have to be prepared for. It's a battle with an adversary that's there ready to take you down. I think the, the message version of, of scripture uh, says it well, verse 12. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all of his angels. The Greek word for struggle that's used in this passage, that, that, that's used for the word wrestle. When I, when I was a kid, I, I memorized this verse, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The Greek word that's translated struggle or wrestle is a word that describes hand-to-hand -hand combat, foot-to-foot -foot combat. It's, it's this, this wrestling, this grappling, this, this street fight kind of a concept. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not like boxing where there are rules. It's not even like high school or college wrestling where there are clear rules with three-minute periods. It's much more like mixed martial arts. Where, where guys are fighting literally to the point that, that one is, is so overwhelmed that he has to tap out or something will physically break or he'll die. The battle is real. You know it and I know it. We all experience, but the, the difficult thing is for much of the time, we, chose to, we choose to simply kind of ignore it and pretend that it's not there. But we know that it's real. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Rome, described that battle for him personally. He described what we all experience, but what we can't see or hear. He said this in Romans chapter seven. I can anticipate the response that's coming. 
I know that all of God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't that also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So I can't be trusted to figure out what's best for myself and then do it. It becomes obvious that God's commands are necessary for me. But I need something more. For, for if I know the, the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, and then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment that I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands. But it's pr pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Part of me covertly rebels. And just when I least expect it, that rebellion takes charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled away by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Do you hear Paul's heart in that? It describes the battle that we all live in. It's, we, we live in the middle of a battlefield, in the middle of a war zone. You know, you can find truth in some incredibly strange places. Truth that I, I think is probably God's truth lived out in the lives of other people. I can honestly say, I don't think that I've ever quoted uh, the book, The Art of War by Sun, by Sun Tzu in any message I've ever preached or lesson I've ever taught uh, over the course of my life. But in a message like this one titled, A Powerful Battle, I think what Sun Tzu said is incredibly applicable. He said this, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you'll also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will succumb in every battle. If you don't know who you're fighting, you have no hope of winning. You have to know who you're fighting. You have to know who your enemy is in this spiritual battle that's going on. Hear me in this. Our battle today is not with the COVID-19 virus. Our battle is not with isolation or loneliness. Our battle is not with people who wear masks or people who don't wear masks. Our battle is not with the governor, it's not with the president, it's not with anyone in government. Our battle is not with rioters, with protesters, with bad cops, or even with injustice. Our battle is not with CNN, or Fox News, or the Washington Post, or the New York Times. Our battle is not with the Chinese. Our battle is not with how much money we do or don't have, with whether or not our unemployment checks are gonna be extended or eliminated. Our battle is not with the physical symptoms of addiction, with sexual temptation, whether that's premarital or extramarital or homosexual desire or pornography. Our battle is not with a computer or a television. Our battle is not with our husband or our wife or our kids or our boss. Our battle is against the rulers 
the, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Warren Wearsby said, unless we know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he can do, we will have a difficult time defeating him. Who specifically are we engaged in battle with? The minions of Satan himself. What are his names? What, what, what's, what are the names by which Satan is known? Satan, the devil, Lucifer. Scripture calls him the accuser, the adversary, the father of lies, the destroyer, the prince of this world, the god of this age. What's he trying to do? What, what is his goal? His goal is total devastation of your life and my life and of everything good that God has created. His power is seen in the destruction that's, rampart, that, that, that's evident all around us, that we've seen this week in our world. That's Satan's goal, to destroy everything. What's his plan? Scripture's plan. His plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And Jesus says, contrast that with me. I've come to give you life and to give you life to the full, life abundantly. Don't miss the reality of what's going on in the battle for your soul, the battle for my soul. There's a supernatural world out there that is real. Hear me in this. The occult is real. Demons are real. Evil spirits are real. I don't say that to scare you, but to clarify the battlefield in which we live. One of Satan's tricks is to lull you into thinking that, yeah, there's good and there's evil and they exist in this kind of tension. And if we try and do the right things, good's probably going to win out more times than not. And then we, then we have law enforcement to help, to help right that ship when it gets out of balance. But that tension exists, good and evil, it's all going to be okay. Nothing could be further from the truth that, that they exist equally. God is in control and Satan's trying to destroy Another of Satan's tricks is to try and uh, to make us dismiss him as this Halloween caricature kind of thing of himself. This, this little guy in a red suit with horns, with a pitchfork. Um, uh, that that's what Satan looks like. That couldn't be further from the truth. Scripture tells us that Satan masquerades. He dresses up like an angel of light. He looks good on the outside, but his purpose, his design is to destroy your life, to destroy mine. Just as Scripture helps us understand who God is and how God works, Scripture also helps us understand that Satan is working in our world, that he is alive, that he is about the business of destruction in our world. In 1 Samuel 28, um, Saul had rejected God. Saul was the first king of the nation of Israel, um, and, and David had been anointed the next king. Saul has rejected God, and so he's pursuing David to try and kill him and to, to retain his power. The Philistines, who are the, the arch nemesis of the Israelites, um, are attacking Saul and the Israelites, and Saul's basically scared. He thinks the Philistines are going to win. And so even though he's rejected God, Saul cries out to God and says, God, save me, you know, intervene, uh, help us out of this mess. But because he's rejected God, he doesn't hear anything in response. He doesn't know what to do. So Saul makes a choice. He pursues a path of going to visit a medium, a spiritualist, someone who can contact the dead, uh, a, a lady that's, that lives in the town of Endor. Um, she's often known in Scripture as the Witch of Endor. And even though Saul has, has um, abolished all of the, all of the mediums, all, the, all of the spiritualists from the nation of Israel, this one woman is there, and Saul goes and talks to her and asks her to conjure up Samuel, the prophet Samuel from the dead, who had originally anointed him. 
Um, what's really interesting about this scripture is that it describes, uh, as best we can understand as reality, this encounter. Um, the medium is actually able to, to bring back Sam, uh, Samuel to talk to Saul. And Saul, when he, or Samuel, when he comes back, says to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up from the dead? And, and he says to Saul, those things that I told you while I was still alive, that your kingdom is going to be taken from you, that, that, uh, that you're going to die, and that, that your reign will not continue, those things are coming to pass. Your kingdom is going to be taken out of your hands and, and given to David as the next king of Israel. Uh, scripture describes that uh, in a very clear way to say that that world, that realm exists. You know, I heard a story this week about, uh, about a spiritualist, a, a fortune teller, a medium, whatever, that, that actually was a, a dwarf, a, a little person, a midget, um, that was stealing money on the side. And so the police put out an uh, all points bulletin for a small medium at large. Think about that for a second. The spiritual world is real. In Matthew 4, after his baptism, Jesus encounters someone that, that Matthew describes as the tempter. And, and if you read that with fresh eyes, you understand that, that, that Satan came to Jesus in some kind of physical form and interacted with him. The spiritual battle is real. The, the tempter tempted Jesus, and Jesus battled him with Scripture. In Matthew 17, Jesus drives out a demon that was causing seizures in a boy. In Luke 11, Jesus drives out a demon that made a man unable to speak. In Mark 5, there's a man who's so possessed by demons that, uh, that chains can't hold him. He has supernatural strength because of the demonic activity that's inside him. He runs around naked, he shrieks, he lives in caves, and he encounters Jesus. When Jesus casts the demon out of him, the demons out of him, they're cast into a herd of pigs, and 2,000 pigs run off a cliff into the sea. Demonic activity was real in the first century world. I gotta believe that it's real in our world as well. As well. Um, Jesus said that, that the symptoms of these people were the result of demonic activity. Not a birth defect, not um, a mental health issue, not the result of bad parenting. They were the result of demons. And when they were cast out, their symptoms stopped. Please, please don't misunderstand me in this. Not all physical symptoms are the result of demonic activity. I don't think, I don't think that, that, that that's true at all. But I think it would be foolish for us to believe that demons are not alive and working in the world in which we live today. In Acts 16, a woman is described as having the ability to tell the future because of demonic power. Paul casts the demon out of this woman. It ultimately causes a riot in the city because uh, the, the people who owned this, this slave girl uh, had lost their, uh, their ability to make money off of her ability to tell the future. In Daniel 10, in the Old Testament, an angel comes to give a message to Daniel. And he says to Daniel, I, I, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get here. For three weeks, I've been in, in a spiritual battle with demons in order to come and, and, and uh, minister to you. For three weeks, that spiritual battle uh, has gone on before I finally prevailed with the help of Michael. The spiritual battle that we can't see, that we can't see with our own eyes, is nonetheless very real. It, so if we're in that battle, what do we do? What are our marching orders? What is our call to action? Ephesians 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord. Notice that Paul didn't say, be strong by the Lord. He, what he said was, find your strength in your relationship with God. 
It all depends on, on that connection that you have to him. That's where the power comes from. That's why it's so important to be a prayer warrior, to pray, to pray on behalf of yourself, to pray on behalf of others. Man, if, if, uh, if you've got somebody that you love, that you think, man, they are, I don't know if they're oppressed, I don't know if they're possessed, I don't know what it is, but you can intercede and intervene for them in prayer. And let me encourage you to do that, to pour yourself out in praying for them, to pour yourself out in talking to God, in, in laying out the things that you struggle with, as Paul did in, um, in Romans 7. Pray, pray, pray. Pour scripture into yourself in that spiritual battle to, to be strong in the Lord. How do we develop that relationship? It's by getting God's word into our heart, into our head, so that it's there at all times, able to be used, able to be used as a weapon against Satan. That relationship that we have with God is the center of our power. Be strong in the Lord. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God. Come back next Sunday. We're going to unpack what that armor looks like. It's in the next several verses. Feel free to read ahead. But that's next week's message. And it's so important as, as, a, as a second part to today's message about the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. We've got to understand our enemy. We've got to understand the battle. But let me give you these words about how to, how to respond to the battle as well. Don't intentionally walk in minefields. In any war zone, the, um, the one side or the other, other often will bury mines under the ground so that when you step on it, uh, it kills the, the person who steps on it. It wreaks havoc and destruction. Don't walk into spiritual minefields intentionally. That, that probably has to do with the occult, has to do with drugs, it has to do with alcohol. Anything that can obscure your ability to hear to recognize and to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Stay away from those things. It will cloud your judgment and it will ultimately result in your destruction. 1 Peter 5 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is powerful, yes, but you don't need to be afraid. 1 John 4 says, You, dear children, you're from God, and you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. The one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to shy from the battle. We don't need to walk away. We need to allow God to work through us, his spirit guiding us in that relationship. If Satan has a foothold in your life, if he has your arm tied behind your back, if he holds you as a prisoner of war, let me just encourage you, repent and throw him out. Uninvite him. Cast him out of your life. Say to Satan in the midst of temptation, I belong to Jesus. Because of Jesus, you don't have power over me. I'm a child of the King. I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus at the cross. And then replace that sinful behavior that gave Satan access to your life in the first place. Don't follow that same path that allowed him in to have control over you. You know, in this whole concept of spiritual battle, there, there are... Um, uh, there are three tools that I, I just want to encourage you to take advantage of if you like to read, if you like to be encouraged in this way. The, the first is a book called The Bondage Breaker by Neil Anderson. It's a great, great book about how to break strongholds of Satan that exist in your life. The second is, uh, it's a fictional book, but, uh, but I'd encourage you to read it as well. It's called Screwtape Letters, The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. It's uh, about conversations that, uh, fictional conversations that exist between demons as they talk about the people that they've been assigned to, to draw away from God. There's tremendous spiritual insights from C.S. Lewis in that book, and, and it's well worth reading. 
The last book is a, is a book that was written a whole bunch of years ago, but it's, it's a book that, that for me, as I was growing up, just really made me aware of, this, of the spiritual battle that's going on in the world around us. It's called This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. It's a fictional work. Um, it's one, one person's perception of what's going on, but it will make you very aware of the spiritual battle that exists in the world. Um, we don't understand it. We can't see it yet. But it's there, and it's real. When I started the message and I talked about the, the story of Elisha and his servant, um, the end of that story is about as strange as any uh, movie about an alternate reality uh, that you can get. It's uh, any, any concept of that. The, the end of the story is just really, really incredible. The Arameans come ready to capture the town of Dothan, and, and the servant goes out, sees the army, is scared. Elisha says, God, open his eyes. The servant looks, and he sees this, this host of angels, fiery chariots, ready to come down and wipe out the Arameans. God opens his eyes to be able to do that. And Elisha then prays to God and says, God, would you, would you make, you've opened the eyes of my servant, would you blind the eyes of the Aramean army? And God answers and does. And all of a sudden, this army that came to capture Elisha is in chaos. Everyone is blind. They don't know what to do. And uh, you know what happens? Elisha goes out to talk to the, to the army. And in some kind of Jedi, Jedi mind trick kind of way, he says, this is not the road that you're looking for. This is not the road that you're looking for. You're in the wrong place. Follow me and I'll take you to the guy that you're searching for. And the crazy thing is the Arameans follow him. They follow him. Elisha leads them into the city of Samaria, a walled city. They all come in together. They shut the gates and they're captured. The king of Israel says to Elisha, can I kill him? Can I kill him? They're all here. I can just wipe them all out. And Elisha says to the king of Israel, why would you do that? This army has been delivered into your hands by God. You haven't had to do anything. They're right here um, in your possession. Instead, give them food and water. Give them something to eat and drink. And then send them, send them home to their king. And you know what the king of Israel does? Something incredibly interesting. He throws a feast for this opposing army. Talk about alternate reality. This, this is just so strange. He throws a feast for the army. And after they've eaten, after they've drunk... He sends them home to Aram, to their king. And, and, and the end of that episode in Scripture says, and the Arameans stopped harassing, stopped fighting the nation of Israel. The war was over because of the path that the king of Israel and Elisha had taken to honor God. We are in a powerful battle. It's not an alternate reality. It's probably more real than the world that we can see and touch and feel. Ephesians 6 says, Therefore, because you're in this battle, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after everything, to stand. That's our challenge. It's a powerful battle. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would help us, that you would help us see the seriousness of the spiritual battle that's going on around us. God, that it wouldn't be just playing around for us, but that we would grasp the danger, the destruction that Satan wants to wants to wreak on us to bring into our lives. God, we ask for your power, for your strength, for your deliverance. And we ask for clarity in our eyes that we may honor you and we may live for you and that we may, um, that we may see eternity in your presence because of what happens right now. God, guide us, lead us, save us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Come back next week for the armor of God.